Now being recorded. So hello everybody. Thanks for joining us today for Quasi's Cyber Seminar Series. My name is Kayla Berry and I'm Quasi's Communications and Outreach Specialist and I help to um, sort of moderate, help to moderate the Cyber Seminar Series and I just want to say thank you for joining us today. We're glad you're here. Something I kind of like to start off by doing is just asking people to type um, where they're calling in from, their university, their affiliation, into the chat box so we can get an idea of where everyone is. Sometimes it's hard to know based on the participant list where you're calling in from, and I like to get an idea of who's on the line. So if you could do that, I would appreciate that. And then I would also just like to say um, that we are organizing a workshop for February. It's a sensor workshop, and so if you're interested in learning new uh, instrumentation techniques, uh, look into joining us and I'll send out a, an announcement in the coming weeks, probably mid-November, to the Quasi listserv with that information. But for right now, I would just like to let um, Adam Ward, our Cyber Seminar Series host, introduce our presenter for today. Well, thank you very much, Kayla. And again, our thanks to you for all the hard work in, in organizing this. Um, welcome all to the third in our series of uh, five seminars this semester. Um, I'm pleased today to be introducing Tommy Singer, uh, who's an associate professor in the Department of Geology and Geological Engineering and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, at Colorado School of Mines. Um, her prior post was at Penn State University in the Department of Geosciences. Um, Tommy's background is a bachelor's degree um, from the University of Connecticut and her PhD in hydrogeology from Stanford University. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the reason we invited Kamini today to talk about um, hydrogeophysics, she's really been a, a pioneer in this field, um, as evidenced by her involvement in helping form the Near Surface Geophysics Group, and, uh, <coughs> group chairing the Hydrogeophysics um, Interest Group at AGU, and her position as an associate editor at Water Resources Research. Um, just a few of the many highlights um, from her career. And with that, I won't take any more time away. Uh, Comedy, I'd like to turn things over to you. And thank you again. Welcome. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, it's, it's really interesting talking to an audience of people I can't see. So um, this will be a, a new fun experience for me as well. Um, what I wanted to do today was maybe something a little different than some of the other cyber seminars that have happened so far, which is that um, I, I thought I would sort of highlight what my community is doing as a whole rather than just my own research. Um, I have contributions here from a number of people whose names are in orange um, that have contributed slides to this talk, and there's just some really cool things happening within hydrogeology where people are applying geophysical methods to some new problems and to look at processes and parameters, and I thought what I'd try to do is, is highlight some of the things that we're doing as a group um, so that those of you on the line who may be less familiar with some of these geophysical tools could see what we're doing from sort of the smallest scale up to, to the really large scale, the watershed scale and beyond. Um, and so what I'm going to do as I flip through these slides is um, you'll notice names in orange and tiny, t and tiny font at the bottom. And that's the person who contributed that slide to me. I have all the references uh, for all the, the papers that have been published associated with this. And I, my understanding is that this presentation will be archived so that people can access it as a PDF. So if there's particular um, topics that were of interest to you, you should be able to go back and find those papers. And I'm happy to answer any questions on any of this work and put you in contact with um, the right people if you are interested in something specific that is not mine. So um, with that in mind, let me see if I can advance the slide. Oh, check this out. So, um, so part of the reason that we care, I mean, this is preaching to this choir, is, is um, you know, we're interested in aquifer parameters. We're interested in processes associated with fluid flow and solute transport. And, um, you know, these are fundamental to, to making you know, all sorts of assessments in terms of policy and, and water use and utility and creating schemes for cleanup. And um, the problem, of course, is that the subsurface is just incredibly complex. And so um, we're constantly fighting with the battle that what's below the ground is hard to see and where we get those data um, from are, 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 are limited and that we've got a few things to work with, right? We've got um, some really high-tech instrumentation. Um, like shovels and students um, and what they can do. And, and if we're super lucky, maybe we have a drill rig. But um, this is generally what we're working with as hydrogeologists. So um, what I thought I'd talk about today is sort of expanding beyond that because there's a limit to how many holes we want to drill. And I'm sure that most of you have seen this, this image before. It's a great photo from Dennis LeBlanc um, at the USGS um, showing this, this well field out at the old Otis Air Force Base. 
And the distance to the trees is about 225 meters in this image. And so you can see there's just a tremendous amount of information that they're getting from this site. But the question that we all ask ourselves is, how much are we actually impacting the field we're trying to study by the time we drill this many holes? So what I'm going to talk about today is some geophysical tools and what they might offer us as a community of, of hydrologists um, that, that we wouldn't standardly get from, from well bore measurements. So you know, the, the, the sort of short answer for what geophysics can bring to the table is that we can get really high data sampling density. We can collect a lot of data in a short period of time. The costs of these measurements are generally lower than what we would get um, from direct sampling. Um, and that uh, these uh, measurements are sort of minimally invasive. Uh, sometimes we need boreholes, but a lot of things we can do on the surface or we can do in an airborne um, sense. And the measurement volume we get is larger, and potentially that's more appropriate for what we need with our modeling needs. So um, what we're looking at here is, are, is instrumentation that may allow us to say something about the subsurface without affecting the hydrology of the system. So, um, oops, I'm clicking the wrong thing here. So. Um, we're going to talk about a series of scales today. I'm going to start at sort of, I'm going to skip the core measurements, but I'm going to work from sort of the wellbore logging scale and uh, sort of surface geophysics up to some really nice airborne work that um, a colleague, Burke Minsley at the USGS, has provided. And um, I'll show you sort of a, a range of different spatial extents um, that we're looking at. Just as a sort of a reminder, there's sort of a trade-off between uh -huh. what we can cover in terms of spatial extent and how well resolved we can get those features. So generally, the bigger we're measuring something, the less um, resolution we have on those particular measurements. So um, in terms of the history of, of geophysics, people have been using geophysics for hydrologic type studies for a really long time. And this is a nice example from Adel Zodi from Adel the 60s, Zodi. looking at uh, geoelectrical and seismic refraction investigations um, in San Jose, uh, California. And what you can see here is an image of the apparent resistivity. So this is measured from an electrical resistivity type tool where they're driving current into the ground and measuring the source of voltage and uh, an interpretation at the bottom. So a lot of these old studies were just focused on defining lithological boundaries. And to be honest, that's still of interest, and people are still working on this. Um, there's some really nice work here. Um, this is Harry Joel's um, work that was published in the Canadian Journal of Earth Science. And what you see here is sort of the same sort of things that we were doing years ago, but at a much higher resolution, where people are looking at how ground penetrating radar, in this case, how these reflectors differ within a depositional environment. So people are saying something about um, you know, how sediment was laid down in a fluvial um, deposit, in this case, uh, and, and being able to image that from the subsurface. So we're still doing things like lithologic boundaries. And with the onset of, say, the critical zone observatory here in the US, there's been a lot of interest in depth to bedrock. And geophysics can do that. Um, but geophysics can do a lot of things that are also incredibly cool that move beyond that. And there was a big push, especially in the 90s, um, to start using geophysics to say something more quantitative about process. And part of the reason for this is we were looking for data to put into our hydrologic models, especially these stochastic hydrology models that are data hungry. So there are lots of methods, and I don't um, have time within this, this very short hour we have together to talk about all of the different methods that exist. But um, there's some, some fairly common ones that are used within hydrology, which are here. Another one that I, I should have listed, um, but you'll, you'll hear from Steve Lohide in a few weeks, would be temperature, would be another one that might fall within a geophysical tool. But there's a, a range of, of different methods. And um, I'm going to talk mostly about electrical and electromagnetic tools, which are the bottom four on this list. Um, seismic methods are, are somewhat underutilized within the hydrologic community. There, there aren't a ton of people doing work within that. And it's kind of a shame. I think there's a lot of space for us to be doing some neat things with um, seismic methods, in no small part because it's the only tool that we have that's actually measuring something that we're interested in hydrologically directly, and that would be something like porosity and permeability. A lot of these other methods um, don't tell us anything <laughs> directly about hydrologic um, parameters, like hydraulic conductivity, but they measure something else. And I guess the important point that I'd like to make is that what we're measuring are, is in the right-hand column. At no point are we ever measuring contaminant concentration or um, permeability or hydraulic conductivity. And the way that we get from these tools to those properties is through sort of some complicated rock physics that aren't always right. And I'm going to talk about that later. But I just want to be clear um, for hydrologic community that these geophysical tools aren't measuring hydrologic parameters directly. But we can use them to say something, to infer something about those parameters. And in a time lapse mode, if we look at how these properties change with time, they're often related to processes that we're interested in. So the host has left the meeting to speak with meeting support and will rejoin soon.
I'm not sure if anyone else could hear that, but I was just told the host can leave the meeting. But um, anyway, so um, we'll just keep going. So um, what I'm going to talk about today are a few hydrologic problems where geophysics can help. And uh, these specifically would be things like preferential pathways, determining where those are, M looking at the movement of conductive contaminants, things that are electrically conductive we can see. Um, we'll talk about some uh, gas transport and then uh, some groundwater surface water exchange. So I've got some applications here that I'd like to, to just highlight. And I'll try to go through these fairly quickly because there's a lot of them and there's some really cool things here. And then we can talk more about them in detail if people are interested. So um, this is a really nice example from Jonathan Nyquist at Temple. And uh, what this is, is he is looking at uh, preferential pathways in a shallow soil system within the Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory. And uh, what they were interested in here was uh, preferential pathways, taking a look at how water moves through the soil. So they had trenched um, a small area within this watershed. And flow in these two images is going from top to bottom down that hill slope. And what this is, is it's an image of ground penetrating radar reflectance. And what you're seeing is a, a change in reflectance associated with moisture. Um, moisture water has a very high dielectric permittivity compared to dry soil. And so as you introduce water within that system, it changes um, the signal that you would see from ground penetrating radar. And what you're seeing here is the, the highlighting of some connected pathways after it, um, adding water to this system. Um, so you can kind of think of this as sort of like a miniature version of satellite radar mapping. And it just happens to be an, at this particular site they're interested in really small scale features and how water moves down this hill slope and ends up contributing to the discharge that we measure within these streams. So um, when you look at these surveys, the pattern is, is more or less the same, but some areas show increased reflectivity, which is indicating more moisture near the surface. You could do similar work at a larger scale. This is a nice example from uh, Frederick Newt Guyen, who's at, um, at the University of Liege. And I should point out that there's an international group of people that have contributed data to this. Um, to this pre presentation. But in this particular case, what they were looking at was fractured, fractured rock. And um, so what they're trying to do here is um, look at drinking water issues in this particular system and also potential contamination paths. One of the hard things with fractured rock systems, and many of you undoubtedly know this having worked in similar systems, is just how hard it is to characterize connectivity of these features and exactly where they are. Um, and the success of sort of classical tracer tests um, you know, depends greatly on where our monitoring wells are. So what um, Frederick's group had done here is they had uh, done a salt tracer test where they injected water over a packed interval here, and they took a look at um, a series of planes using electrical resistivity to map those flow paths. And uh, this, these two uh, images that are shown here are 15 and 30 meters away from the injection location, and what you can see here are some hot spots that indicate that there's flow uh, moving in these particular areas. We've gotten from sort of monitoring movement like this to doing some really high quality um, detailed characterization also that could be put into flow models. This is the kind of information we could use as soft data to infer uh, flow models. Um, here's an example from Michigan State um, done by uh, Minne Dogan as part of her PhD work. And um, what they're showing you here is, again, some uh, ground penetrating radar data at the top. You see some really nice features looking similar to sort of the work that we looked at earlier from um, Harry Joel's work. You see these, these features here in this fluvial environment within Mississippi. And uh, down at the bottom, what they've shown is these GPR images from three different planes here and correlated direct push hydraulic conductivity measurements. And so what they've done is they had data here. They had enough detailed data. They used the GPR to interpolate sort of hydraulic conductivity at the site, such that they could parameterize flow and transport models uh, in this particular system. There's a really nice correlation between both methods here, mm -hmm. suggesting that in this particular site, at least, there's a hydrostratigraphic framework um, with distinct characteristics um, that can be used to interpret the GPR data in terms of facies, hydrologic facies where that you could use for flow. Um, so there's a, a whole bunch of things that people have been able to do with geophysical tools. On a slightly different end of things, uh, some data from Dale Rucker, who works at Hydrogeophysics, is uh, looking at how solutes move that we introduce. In this case, um, this is a study where they were introducing uh, sodium cyanide uh, into the subsurface. And you can imagine that that might be interesting to know where that goes. Um, but this is uh, looking at gold leaching. So I guess uh, typically, when looking at gold recovery, and the idea was to uh, increase gold recovery at a, at a site here in Colorado. They uh, usually what ends up happening is that they take these gold piles and they put drip irrigation lines over the surface of that rock pile. This pile of material was at Cripple Creek, and it was about 600 feet tall. 
And it turned out that amending the chemistry, amending the, the cyanide to that depth was impossible um, with surface leaching. And so what they decided to do was uh, put in some boreholes and try to inject sodium cyanide that way, and they wanted to see exactly where that material moved. Um, the deeper part of this, heel, uh, this heap had gone uh, acidic, and that reduced the ability for them to be able to dissolve gold at the site. And the injections were meant to target areas deep within that rock pile as a means to get extra gold. And so they used these, again, electrical images in this case in a time-lapse sense to understand how far they were pushing this, the solute uh, in while injecting. And that allowed the, the operators of the site to sort of tweak the operational parameters a bit to see if they could get the solution out farther um, until they could sort of find an unoptimized set of parameters for this, this system. This is a money-saving uh, issue in this regard. Um, they estimated that each well produced maybe about 50 ounces more than would have been expected um, without this injection. And today's rate is about $1,700 uh, an ounce. So this is a, a very cost-effective use of, of geophysics. Um, there's also uh, the use of uh, geophysical tools in terms of temperature. And we've seen this in a lot of different settings, uh, certainly within the groundwater for surface water literature in the last few years, there's just been an explosion of the use of distributed temperature sensing, which I'm not really going to talk about much here because John Selker, Selker will be talking about that, I think, next week. Um, but besides just distributed temperature sensing or thermistors themselves, electrical uh, methods are also sensitive to temperature. Most of the time, this is a bother for us. We're trying to figure out how to account for the fact that there are temperature changes within our data. But we can also um, use this from a uh, we can uh, utilize this information. And, uh, and here's an example from a geothermal exploitation system here. Um, and usually in these, these geothermal applications, um, we rely mainly on borehole observations of the temperature from a few locations. But the idea with this particular project is um, that the scientists here have mapped both spatially and temporally temperature using electrical resistivity. So. Um, what they are able to do here is map over a much larger spatial extent um, the changes in temperature within the system using a different method than just sort of standard temperature measurements that will give you some indication of what's happening at a point. So um, there's some temperature applications here aside from the sort of groundwater, surface water stuff that people may have seen before. People are also using geophysical tools to think about uh, systems that may relate to climate change. Um, a nice example um, is here from Lee Slater, who is at Rutgers University. And uh, what he and his group have been thinking about is determining how much uh, methane gas is present and where it's trapped um, within some northern peatlands. And this is fundamental to understanding the global, global carbon cycle. Um, and uh, what they used was some um, ground penetrating radar in and they were imaging a peatland complex to look at the distribution of biogenic gas in the and how it might be controlled by vegetation. So uh, much of the work that they've done suggests that methane is in the free phase. And that it can flow water. Uh, can, anyone else, can anyone else hear that noise? It might just be me, but um, really, really noisy on my end. We're all hearing that. I can hear that, too. Um, Tommy, are you there? Yeah, I can. Thank you. I can tell that too many people can't hear me. No, can you hold on one second? Let me get an operator on the line. Comedy? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. One moment. Let me get an operator on the line. Sounds good. Find better comedy? Uh, a bit. It does sound like Chelsea just uh, made a comment that it might be feedback from somebody's phone. Well, can you try to actually. use the phone or push the car this will help? Yeah, I think I have an unmuted phone. The host has left the meeting to speak with meeting support and will rejoin soon. I think that's what it is. It might be a speakerphone. Oh, wait, it's quiet again. Tommy, I think we're, we've got something fixed here, so if you want to try to keep going. Absolutely, uh, yeah. We'll do our best to, to keep No problem. Fixed. Yeah, thank you. If, if that happens again, feel free to, um, on the chat, just, People let me know that it's it's loud. I, I think I can hear I can hear it on my end, and I just wanted to make sure I wasn't alone. Um, okay, so I'm talking about Lee Slater's work here, um, and so what they were doing here was using GPR, ground penetrating radar, to image a peatland complex here in Minnesota, and uh, they were looking at the distribution of biogenic methane gas in this peatland and how it might be controlled by vegetation type. 
So there's been a lot of previous work that suggests that um, methane in the free phase accumulates below woody layers in peat and then is episodically released during changes in atmospheric pressure when buoyancy forces suddenly increase. And so what they decided to do is actually see if they could image that distribution of gas here. Um, Pardon so the interruption. This is yes. the operator, Chris. You have been brought in to help with the, um, feedback in the conference. Are we still getting uh, noise in the conference? I think we're okay at the moment, but thank you. Okay. I'll go ahead and exit the conference. If anyone does feel the need to mute their line, they can do that by pressing star six. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thanks. Well, that was fun. They're always so polite. Um, all right, so um, what I'm showing you here, again, is another image of uh, Lee's from this work uh, that was cited on that last page. So this is a, a basin-scale GPR image. So this is actually a pretty, um, a pretty extensive uh, survey for ground-penetrating radar. They've covered about a, um, you know, 1,400, 1,600 meters of land surface here. So this is a pretty long GPR line. And what you see is a, a variation in depth to the mineral soil contact. Um, which is uh, marked in, in these slides here. You can see it in the, the bottom right-hand image there. Um, and there's really excellent uh, correspondence with cores. And so what they've been able to do here is look at the transition between peat types as visible on the radar. And um, there's some arrows on the upper image, and they indicate channels within that mineral soil that are probably uh, permeable drainage channels. And they, uh, that's probably at those locations that there's an exchange of mineral soil water with the peat. Um, and so evidence for this exchange is localized um, attenuation of the reflectors. So that's what we're seeing is sort of a, an increase in attenuation of those images. So you see really sharp um, reflectors. And for those of you that aren't used to looking at GPR data, and it looks a lot like seismic data, but it used to be we'd print the stuff out and we'd hold it on a piece of paper and look at it down the length of the paper. So you could see the continuity of some of these reflectors. And you can see some areas where there just aren't a lot of reflections. It's just very gray looking. And that, that, that section of the image is where there's attenuation of the, ref, the reflectors. And um, that's uh, where we think this exchange is happening in this particular site. Um, an image that might be uh, more f uh, friendly, perhaps, to the hydrologic audience is what they did in terms of interpretation of that GPR data, which is here. And what they did is they made a plot of gas content here. So this is just an interpolated image of the free phase biogenic gas content across the peatland. And this was based on some GPR analysis. Uh, there was some common midpoint data here for those of you that are interested in GPR. And there's really strong evidence for high gas content below woody layers where the vegetation is actually forested. So the more lawn type areas, um, they tend to have a much lower gas content. And the fen in the watershed there shows the lowest gas content entirely. So, um, so what they've been able to do here is actually image uh, where, where this methane gas is within a system. So a pretty nice example of something you can do with ground penetrating radar. There have been some other nice examples of using geophysical tools to contribute to ecological studies. And another one um, is here, some more work actually from the folks at Michigan State, where they've been looking at um, rooting depths with geophysics. And uh, so what they have here is on those upper images, they've got some 2D electrical resistivity images um, across a, an ecotone here in Michigan, where they're going from some forested to a, um, a sort of a more grassland type uh, material here. And they took some images through time, through seasons, uh, through a growing season for some different plant communities, both this, this forest here and this grassland. And um, that lower plot, uh, what it does is it shows you a spatially average difference between the soil moisture before the start of the growing season in May and at the peak of the growing season, which was in August. And the data show a significantly larger seasonal change in soil moisture for the forest um, and also that the trees here have effective, uh, they have deeper effective roots, at least in this particular um, system. And uh, what uh, the folks at Michigan State have been doing with these data is using them to help improve the parameterization of roots within some global climate models and some hydrologic models. So this has been some really neat work um, that contributes to, to much larger scale models um, than um, then, then historically they've been able to, to, to get that sort of detailed parameterization. Um, other things that people have been looking at are changes in dynamics. Um, here's an example from Watsonville, California, of an infiltration pond. So this is a sort of an, a, a storage system that the town of Watsonville was uh, putting together where they were filling an infiltration pond. And they were interested in storing that water seasonally and then in having it sort of slowly inject into the aquifer below as an aquifer storage recovery experiment. And this is some work of Adam Pizlosecki, who's at the University of Calgary. So uh, here's the pond before it was filled. 
And uh, what Adam and his group have been doing is actually some really nice engineering of electrical resistivity probes that they build themselves. And uh, they build them on PVC pipe and uh, put a series of electrodes just using um, aluminum or sort of a, a, a stainless steel foil that looks a lot like an aluminum foil. And they build these really nice um, electrode systems. And they, they've been doing things with metal that's much fancier. And they direct push these things into the ground. And uh, here's an image from his data set. And what this is, is it takes a minute to sort of swallow this data. Um, if we look at the top image, what you see in blue is the elevation of the pond. So um, what you have up there at the, the very top is the filling of that pond. And this data um, is going from January 1st. The time zero is January 1st throughout the year. And uh, that area that's sort of shaded in gray, they had some problems with the pressure transducer in there. So um, he just wanted me to point out that the values within that gray area are a little more questionable in terms of the stage. Um, but they fill this pond up, and you see that in blue. And, um, and then in red, what you see is the electrical conductivity, the fluid electrical conductivity of the water within that infiltration pond. And at early time, it's, it's pretty high because they're picking salts up off the surface, off that, that, that landscape there that's not wet. And it gets a bit cleaner through time. And then you start to see some evaporative and some thermal effects later in the summer, which is what you see later in time. What's incredibly cool about um, the image at the bottom is what this is, is this is um, 400 measurements, electrical uh, conductivity measurements of the bulk material that have been made along a probe that they put in the ground here to 30 meters depth. And uh, there's 25 electrodes here. Total, they're at about one meter spacing. And the image that they've shown you here is uh, been inverted with a 1D model. So they're inverting for electrical conductivity along a 1D profile. They tested this with a 2D model. And um, what it includes is a variable pond height and variable electrical conductivity as seen in the upper plot. So uh, one of the things you see here is he's showing you a plot of resistivity. At the very bottom of the image, you see a clay layer. And that stays fairly constant in terms of where it is in time. Any variation in that is, is probably pull up from some of the, the uh, images above. But there's a clay layer at the bottom of this pond. And uh, what you see there in red is a Vado zone. Basically, it's dry. So at early time, before the um, they add water to this infiltration pond, you see a clear Vado zone. And then beneath that, you start to see um, saturation. When they turn that pump on, you see instantaneously, you see a saturated layer forming. And then something really interesting happens around day 40. And this is a problem that Wat the folks in Watsonville were trying to deal with, which was that they were having lots of issues with clogging of these systems. They weren't exactly sure what was happening within the system. And so these data provided um, some of the first indication of what was happening. So around day 40, what ends up happening is that the system starts to clog. Um, sediment is starting to settle within this pond. And you can see sort of at that sort of day 50 to 100 at the very upper layer, you still see water sitting on top of that system. But you see this bright red uh, layer that continues all the way um, over from, the, to, from sort of day 50 all the way to the end of time here, which is a Vado zone, a sort of a drying out um, system that's, that's forming underneath this pond as, um, as the system clogs up. So this has provided a whole lot of data and sort of um, what's happening in the subsurface here that otherwise is a little bit harder to see. Um, right. So one of the other systems, uh, one of the things that it's certainly I've noticed is a boon within the, the water resources research um, sort of publications lately. There's been a ton of work on groundwater surface water exchange and using some new techniques to try to say something about those systems. Um, here's an image I really like. It was from Andy Binley. He took a photo of the student um, who's obviously trying to see what's down there um, in this system. And the idea of trying to figure out what's happening within these stream systems, which in some ways are easier than in groundwater systems and that there's at least a surface water body to think about. But um, it's complicated by the fact that um, you, know, you do have this aquifer surrounding the stream. And there's been a, a ton of work in, in recent years. It's certainly become a very hot topic over the last 10 or so years is thinking about the hyporheic zone. And that is just from two Greek roots there, hypos and, and rios, hypos meaning below and rios meaning flow. The idea is it's the part of the aquifer that surrounds the river where the surface water of the river becomes groundwater and then goes back to being surface water. <coughs> and so it's an exchange zone where there's really high um, uh, gradients and things like dissolved oxygen and organic matter. And it's a bit of a, a biogeochemical hotspot because there's a lot of uptake of nutrients so in terms of denitrification or of metals. And so that's part of what makes this really interesting. And there's a ton of methods that have come out um, to think about hyperreic exchange and groundwater surface water exchange, some of which you'll hear in the next couple of quasi talks that John Selker and, um, and uh, Stephen Lohide will be presenting. And in fact, while I'm talking about Steve Lohide, I will, I will plug some work that he did a, a while back, which was actually some airborne 
um, infrared camera work where um, this is from Kansas and what they were doing was flying over with a an un an unpersoned um, little flight uh, machine here. They were flying with a camera over this area in Kansas and looking at the Arkansas River and um, looking at groundwater, surface water exchange here and uh, mixing zones within the system. This is something published in Remote Sensing and the Environment a while back. But there's some other tools besides just temperature that um, we've been using in terms of the geophysical community. Um, here's some work from, uh, again, from Jonathan Nyquist and, and his uh, group, Laura Torin at Temple. And uh, what they've done here is actually a really nice study looking at tracer lingering within the hyperreic zone. So one of the things we think about is when we do these tracer tests within streams is the long tail at the end of these concentration histories that we collect within the stream and what that tells us about transient storage. The problem with the hyperreic zone is it's very hard to study that part of the aquifer. We've got the same problems we do in groundwater systems, which is you can only punch so many holes um, until you've changed that system irreparably. So what they had in this particular site is they had a stream and a bunch of in-well um, data that is shown here is labeled number one, breakthrough curves on a series of transects within their stream. But uh, one of the things they saw in some time-lapse electrical data is they saw some hot spots here shown as blue where there's a decrease in electrical resistivity or an increase in electrical conductivity after their tracer test. This 2D image here, you can see the bottom of the stream labeled by a series of black dots. Um, you just see a couple of areas here that still appear, appear to be very salty even after the tracer test has been completed. And you can see here that this, this image is from about 300 minutes into their tracer test, which is well after things have cleared out of the stream. So what they ended up doing, which I thought was quite cool, is they went in there and they froze some core and were able to pull out um, material from the hyperreic zone and, um, and take that back to, to sample what was here. So this freeze core sampling preserves both the fines and the, the pore water. And um, while the freezing process changes the salinity via uh, brine exclusion, so quantitative comparison between the resistivity and that pore water concentration is a little problematic, um, you, can still, you can still see that there's traits are stuck within that part of the system. And what those data allowed them to do is confirm that that lingering salt was responsible for these conductive anomalies. And we can start talking about things like residence times, et cetera. Um, Adam Ward, who is um, on the line here, uh, worked with uh, Mike Gusev and I when we were uh, at Penn State, or at least when I was still at Penn State. And, uh, and one of the things that he had done for his PhD work is we were thinking about how changes in um, the hyperreic zone would, um, w would occur throughout seasons. And so we were interested in whether or not um, that zone expands or contracts seasonally within watersheds that were both very steep and very, and very shallow. So some of that work is uh, shown here and is published as, as part of work from Adam's thesis, um, showing that uh, we did a series of tracer injections during base flow recession. So as the stream is drying out through the summer months, um, we did four different tracer injections shown here in, 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 in four different colored squares. And you know we're interested in, in processes like denitrification efficiency seasonally might be one of the reasons you care about this. And um, what we did at each one of these time periods is we kicked the stream concentration up uh, about 100 microsiemens per centimeter above the background. So in every case, there's a, a similar conductivity increase. What I'm showing you here is a series of electrical images um, from three of those four tracer tests. There's nothing wrong with the fourth uh, data set, just but due to some pump problems, we injected a bit more salt than the other cases. And so from a qualitative perspective, just showing you these images, it's a little distracting, so I've just pulled those data out here. Um, but what I'm showing you is a series of um, electrical inversions, so reconstructed images from three different time steps. Um, I'm sorry, from three different times of the year at one time step. These are all three hours after the 48-hour tracer injection had started. And what you see is an increase in bulk electrical conductivity right around the stream itself. As we move forward in time, what you see is that um, that tracer becomes more apparent within the stream, but also in the area around the stream out to 48 hours. So what we start to see is actually a lighting up of that hyperreic zone as we've been injecting salt here for 48 hours. And uh, what's also really interesting is we looked at how this, this system cleaned up with time. And so we took some images six hours and 24 hours after those, those tracer injections. And what you can see, and it's particularly clear in the 33 per, uh, liter per second cases that the stream itself cleans up really quickly. Um, and then you are left with this bathtub ring of solute around the stream. Um, that's going to hang out for a much longer period of time. So if we're thinking about residence times of solutes within the system, we can actually image, and as far as we know, this is the first time people have done this, um, that the size sort of approximately of that zone. 
Again, these images are reconstructed, so they tend to be too smooth, and so I'll talk more about that later. I wouldn't um, you know, bet my life on exactly where the system is, but it certainly gives us much better information on um, where that salt is in the subsurface than we would standardly have. It also allowed us to test a hypothesis that we had put forward that maybe we would see um, larger hyporrheic zones at low base flow because there would be less pressure um, coming in from the surrounding aquifer. We realized after the fact that this is not the case, and that in fact this model was probably pretty naive, um, and that we weren't thinking about the fact that the stream flow was changing and also that this is a 3D system. But these data allowed us to, to refute a hypothesis that we had put forward at one point. So I guess the short version here is that there's a million applications for things that people can do with, um, with geophysical tools and in the right hands. I think that these, these tools are incredibly good ways to, if nothing more, interpolate between the hydrologic measurements we have. Um, we can say things about depth to rock and lithologic changes. A lot of these tools are sensitive to, to changes that we're interested in, temperature, soil moisture, you know, the movement of ionic fluids in the subsurface. Um, so the, there's a bunch of things that uh, we can do in the system. The problem, you might argue, is that, and this has been a, sort of an argument within the geophysical community at, you know, at large, is that we spend a lot of time looking at sort of really small systems, things that are sort of tens of meters on a side. And um, one might wonder, you know, how long is, is NSF going to continue to fund us to, in general, as hydrologists, to work on these really, really small systems? And I'm as guilty of that as anyone when you know, we're thinking more and more so about larger scale systems. We're thinking about watershed scale um, hydrology and making models here um, at much, much larger scales. And there's been some really nice work that, that uh, lends, lends itself to this much larger scales too. Um, here's a, some additional work from Lee Slater who had done the peatlands work that I talked about earlier from the Hanford 300 area. And uh, what people were interested here at Hanford was about the exchange between the uranium contaminated groundwater um, which was left over here at Hanford in the river water, the Columbia River. And um, so what Lee and his group had done was um, a whole bunch of imaging here. And what I'm showing in the center, center image is um, some, a series of lines. And those white lines in the river are waterborne surveys of electrical resistivity and induced polarization, which is a, um, a frequency-based electrical method. And the green li lines that are really close to the riverbank is a DTS cable, a distributed temperature sensing cable, which many of you have seen. And if um, you haven't, John Salker, I think, was talking about in part next week. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about the Hanford site is that there's just really high contrast between two different lithologic units there. Um, there's the, the uh, sands and gravels here that have very low uh, hydraulic conductivity, like 0.2 meters per day when put in contrast to some other systems that have say 100 meters per day uh, hydraulic conductivity. So you're seeing in many orders of magnitude variation within this, this fluvial environment between the Hanford material and the Ringgold. And also the river stage itself is highly variable. And so there's a lot of really interesting things within the system in terms of the forcing dynamics, the, the river itself, and the heterogeneity and the hydraulic conductivity. So one of the things that um, we and his group had put forward to do is try to improve that hydrologic framework along that corridor so that they could say something about dynamics of surface water, groundwater exchange, and, um, and also just how heterogeneity might control that. And so um, that was part of, of the work that they had, uh, had uh, pursued here at Hanford. And here's a, a couple of images from their data. So um, what they were actually able to do was um, combine the geoelectrical imaging that they were doing with the distributed temperature sensing. So um, one of the things that you could see from their data is they have some um, induced polarization images here and um, at, the, at the bottom here. And uh, they were able to compare the cross-section of the Ham Hanford Ringgold distribution with the induced polarization and these temperature anomalies that they were seeing from the DTS data shown in those points as they go across. Um, the temperature uh, curve is labeled as a T. And uh, what they see is some focused exchange um, occurring where the Hanford unit was the thickest and no exchange where it was thin or where the Ringgold, which was the very low permeability material outcrops. Um, there's an IP image here um, at the bottom, and there's a black line on that, and that's the water layer, which has been constrained within the inversion. And uh, the white line that's interpreted in the IP data, which is the, the middle image there, is the, uh, the estimated Hanford Ringgold uh, contact. And so what they've been able to do here is both image um, the lithology using the electrical uh, data, so that, that 
uh, central image is the induced polarization. The bottom image is the electrical resistivity, which shows sort of a less significant change here uh, with lithology. Um, but it, you, you might argue you can still see some separation between the Hanford and the Ringgold there. Um, but they can look at the correlation between lithology and their temperature data in order to figure out exactly where um, they think exchange is happening here. The image on the right is the distribution of uh, induced polarization. So looking at the chargeability of this material, um, again, this is a lithologic measure at this particular site at seven meters depth. So the, the cool part of the story is, is perhaps shown in this image here. Um, what they found is that um, when there was a very deep contact between the Hanford and the Ringgold, um, they found that the temperature anomalies that they saw and the stage temperature correlation coincided really well with what was known as uranium, already known uh, to be uranium seeps, but it also appeared that there were many other seeps that people hadn't sampled before. And in areas where there was a really shallow Hanford wrinkled contact, there were no temperature anomalies and no known uranium seeps in this case. Um, so this is a really nice example of using some, uh, a number of geophysical tools together in order to uh, say something about process. Um, within a, in a much larger system than we've been talking about in the fact. Um, in uh, the images on the, the, well, I guess all of the images, it shows up in all, and we see a series of black crosses. And those are the known seepage sites from visual observations. So this wasn't a Lee's group that had actually marked out those seeps, but, but other people. And you can see that correlation that exists pretty strongly um, between the, the depth of the contact there as indicated by the Hanford formation thickness on the left-hand side. The um, other thing that is sort of uh, new and happening is a lot of airborne geophysics has become a lot more popular here. And uh, part of the problem with these airborne methods is, um, or with these ground-based methods, is there's just only so much, so much material that you can say something about, so much ground you can cover. So uh, here's an example of a ground-based resistivity survey. And uh, it might be possible for you to get about a kilometer's worth of linear material covered in a day here. And uh, that's what's being shown here in this image, is a change in electrical uh, resistivity or its inverse conductivity in some area. But what we can do with airborne methods is, is, is much, much greater. We can take that little tiny piece and interpolate it to a much, much bigger scale with airborne methods, where you can do about 100 kilometers an hour. Um, so that's the advantage of these airborne methods. Now, they're pricey, and that's the only um, catch with them, but the sort of things we can cover with these are, are, are pretty impressive. Um, some work that uh, Burke Minsley had sent me, some uh, work that was done by uh, Jared Abraham at the USGS is shown here. And uh, one of the things uh, that they had done was tried to help inform on some groundwater models in Nebraska. So uh, since 2007, Nebraska had actually become the top irrigator in the US, so surpassing both California and, and Texas. And um, part of that uh, was probably that the, the cost of irrigating from wells was fairly cheap, which you can see here in the numbers uh, that are there, about $40 an acre as opposed to $100 plus an acre. So um, there was a passage of a law in 2004 which was meant to strike a balance between water supply and water demand within Nebraska's river basins and put a cap on new irrigation development. One of the things they wanted to be able to do to make these, um, these models was make some really nice hydrologic models of the system so they could say something, they could make some predictions. Um, so uh, there's a, a limited amount of data that you can actually get from, from surface measurements and, and from boreholes. And even with all of these data, um, they had a hard time putting together a hydrologic model that was able to predict what they saw within the system. So um, what they did do is they uh, introduced these airborne lines, which are shown here in, uh, in, in great detail, sort of interpolating between all of the boreholes within the system. And you can see the level of detail um, that's happening within this particular system. So um, these airborne methods just allow you to, to have a, a tremendous amount of information compared to what you would standardly have. There's tons of borehole data here, but even with that, it was inadequate to develop groundwater models, in this case using ModFlow, to make accurate predictions. So this airborne electromagnetics work, which is what I'm showing you here, uh, fills in these higher resolution details about, well, aquifer geometry, forget about the hydraulic properties. And uh, that in its own right made substantially better predictions about flow directions and magnitudes. And, um, and that's hugely important for management decisions given the scale of these fully and over-appropriated basins. Um, some other work uh, that uh, Burke and his uh, team have been doing is looking at electromagnetic imaging of permafrost. And uh, here's, again, an airborne um, image uh, that he'd sent me with an interpretation here below. So there's, um, you know, you can take a look again with um, 
changes in, in these systems. And the, what they're interested in is the evolution of permafrost within cold regions. And that has to be connected to hydrologic processes, connected to climate, connected to ecosystems. And permafrost thawing has been linked to changes in wetland and lake areas, alteration of uh, groundwater contributions to stream flows, carbon release, even increased fire frequency. There's a whole bunch of things that you can get from knowing something about permafrost over a much larger scale. The three-dimensional uh, cutout uh, view at the top is in the vicinity of this 12-mile lake area that they have labeled here. And that gray isosurface is interpreted to indicate the thawed region in the subsurface uh, beneath the lake and uh, some of the other surface water features there. The upper image is a Landsat view of the region displayed below. But uh, this is a, a, a large-scale study that they've been able to do to image permafrost, which I think is a really nice example. Similarly, um, there's been work on helicopter-based electromagnetics to look at saltwater intrusion at the large scale. So there's, there's a lot of things that we can do with these geophysical tools at the much bigger scale and sort of airborne methods. Um, one of the things that there's a balance with here, again, is a, you know, the scale of measurement. Um, the, the amount of data we can collect is huge on these airborne platforms. Um, but um, the resolution might not be quite as fine. But for a lot of the systems that we're thinking about, that's just fine. Um, what's nice about some of these airborne electromagnetic uh, methods is that we're still seeing down 100 meters, 200 meters deep. A lot of other airborne platforms, um, part of the problem with in, within hydrology of a lot of airborne platforms is we end up looking at the top few centimeters of the top meter of the land surface. And if we're interested in groundwater systems, um, some of these geophysical tools allow us to see much, much more deeply into the subsurface. So I guess the last little piece that I'll talk about here is just um, trying to figure out with what we do with all these data. You know, we've got boat tons of geophysical data that we can collect. And uh, there's also a lot of people within my field that are working on how we integrate these into a sort of a more intelligent framework. Um, the other problem that we have is just to reiterate this idea, um, geophysical tools aren't necessarily measuring hydrologic properties. Um, they're not measuring permeability, and they're not measuring the contaminant concentration in some, some system. But they're, they're giving us constraints on process. And if we want to use these data quantitatively, we have to think about the inverse methods that we're using and the rock physics relationships that we develop that connect our geophysical parameters to our hydrologic parameters. So the state of the practice is basically this, that there's some complicated subsurface truth, be that um, changes in you know, uh, electrical conductivity of the subsurface or hydraulic conductivity or moisture content or whatever it is that we're interested in. And uh, what we do is we collect some data, some geophysical data, and oftentimes we're reconstructing images of that subsurface. And so then what we have is a map of some geophysical parameter. Let's say here this is a map of, I don't know, seismic velocity, which is not hydraulic conductivity, which is what we might be interested in. So what we would do is we would come up with a relationship between electrical, um, I'm sorry, seismic velocity and the hydraulic conductivity, and we would try to convert our geophysical data back to whatever it is that we're interested in, permeability, et cetera. Now, that's dependent on a couple of things. It depends on the fact, um, the idea that we have a good rock physics relationship between those, those parameters, which may or may not exist. That relationship needs to be constant, maybe in space and time, or we need to have, be able to build multiple relationships throughout space and time, which is difficult. And uh, the other issue is, is one of um, inversion. When we reconstruct images of the subsurface, um, the way geophysicists think about the inverse the inverse problem is very different than the way that, than the, that hydrogeologists do. As hydrogeologists, we don't tend to be very greedy about our, um, our inverse problems. We have hundreds of head measurements, perhaps, and we might parameterize the subsurface into three distinct layers of hydraulic conductivity. So we have lots of data, many fewer um, parameters that we're solving for. From a geophysical point of view, we have the same number of data, but suddenly we might be asking our models to tell us about a thousand parameters on the subsurface. So the way we think about the inverse problem is really different. And uh, just to show an equation, I'm told every time you show an equation, you lose half your audience. But uh, hopefully this one won't be too bad. Um, what this equation says is we're minimizing an objective uh, function as given by this, this phi term here. And then our total objective function is to minimize the data misfit, shown in green, and the model misfit that's shown in red. And part of the reason we have this model misfit term is because we tend to over-parameterize our inverse models in geophysics. And that means that we have more unknowns than we have data. So we can't just solve the green part of the equation because we might have thousands of data but tens of thousands of parameters. And so there's no way to, you know, we remember this from, from algebra, right? If you have one equation and five unknowns, you're, you're hosed. And the same thing, you know, exists within these inverse problems. So you need some additional information in order to come up with a map 
And what is commonly done within geophysics is to introduce some sort of model smoothness as a way to get these inverse problems to converge. And what that means is that the models that we make are oftentimes just too smooth. And this is the state of the, the practice and not necessarily the state of the science. There are a lot of people working on clever ways to invert data so that we can get beyond this. Um, what this means from a functional point of view, though, is that um, this is an image that's got a lot of subplots going on. But um, what I'm showing you here is if you look at the bottom uh, left-hand image that says true moisture content, what that is is it's a synthetic uh, image of moisture content within the subsurface. And directly above it would be the true electrical resistivity of that system, if we could ever measure that. Instead, what happens is there's something that says resistivity tomogram. That is the best we can do in terms of collecting data in a synthetic sense and reconstructing it um, into an image um, of the subsurface. So this has gone through this inverse problem. And what you can see is that we've lost a lot of the, the high values. We've lost a, little, a lot of the low values. Everything's sort of squished towards the mean, and it's very smooth. What that means is that if I tried to estimate the water content based on that tomogram, I would get the image at the bottom that says estimated water content. It's got the same problems, right? The high values are, are gone, the low values are gone, and it's much too smooth. And this is a function of the fact that I have over-parameterized this inverse problem. Many thousands of, of parameters that I'm solving for, but only a few hundred data. What that means is that if you look at the, the correlation, the relationship between, in this case, moisture content and electrical resistivity, it's really high near the boreholes where the sensitivity is highest for electrical methods, and that falls off as you move towards the center of the plane, meaning that our ability to quantify moisture content away from boreholes with, with electrical geophysics is not so good. We see the exact opposite pattern of correlation, I should just point out, with some wave-based methods like ground-penetrating radar. There, your resolution is highest where you have the most number of intersecting rays. And so what happens then is you see a correlation pattern that's swapped. Pretty bad correlation near the boreholes, but much better correlation in the center of the plane. So one of the things we think about as a community is how can we leverage these differences in resolution to use these tools together to tell us something more about um, hydrologic properties on the subsurface. So that's the big challenge, I think, with geophysics moving forward, is that there's lots of applications where these tools can be useful. But these, these parameters that we measure, seismic velocity and dielectric permittivity and electrical conductivity, they're only sometimes related to what it is that we're interested in. But if we have many data sets that look at different properties and different support volumes and different resolution. If we can find ways to start integrating these things together, we can move forward in a way that, um, that might improve our conceptual models. And there's been some, some really nice work on that um, over many years, and I'll show you a few things here. Um, this is work, again, from Adam Pizlosecki. He's at Calgary. And what he's done here is he's looking at um, some uh, plumes, some contaminant plumes that are moving in the subsurface that are electrically conductive, and that's what his true case is up here, and he's collected a bunch of GPR data, and the standard least squares inversion is shown here, and you can see that it's streaky, um, the way that some of the images we were talking about before are, and some of the highs are uh, underestimated, lows are overestimated, and what he was coming up with was alternate ways of parameterizing the inverse problem. Specifically, if you're interested in contaminant plumes and how they move, why solve for 500,000 parameters in the subsurface, each which is a, is a block of, of you know, velocity or it's a block of electrical conductivity or whatever, why not just solve for things like the mean um, or the center of mass or the, the spatial variance of a plume? Because ultimately, as hydrogeologists, that's often what we're thinking about are those spatial moments. How does something migrate? How does its um, center of mass move? And how does the spread change? Because those things are related to advection and dispersion and diffusion. And so what he's done here is he's tried to parameterize models that um, only have a few parameters, five or ten parameters, um, and try to get back estimates of the plume shape that are just as good as these well over-parameterized uh, least squares models, but maybe do a better job of capturing mass, for instance. While this particular example, where there's 1,600 data, might not be completely compelling, what's really neat about this one is that he shows that when you only have 100 data, so systems that have many fewer data that you're still able to get reasonably good estimates of plumes um, compared to what you would standardly get from least squares reconstructed inversions. So this is a, a step in um, the right direction in terms of alternate parameterization. Within the GPR community, there's also been a big push on what's known as full waveform inversion. And what this does is it allows for a sub-wavelength characterization of the subsurface, which is pretty cool. So um, on the left here, and this is work of uh, Jan van der Kroek, who's at, at, at Forgen Center Mulek. Um, on the left, this is a typical GPR source receiver setup over here. And um, 
Well, actually, what I'm going to show you here is just what full waveform inversion does. So rather than just looking at the first break, which is often what people have done in seismic data and GPR data in the past, um, what they actually take a look at is the entire waveform. And what this means is that they can get, um, rather than just thinking about ray-based methods and first arrival times, they actually do an inv inversion that's based entirely on Maxwell's equations. So they uh, get a lot more information out of the same data sets we've been collecting for a long time. And here's just some examples of of what you would standardly see. Here's some standard ray-based inversion results. So these are the standard inversions that I was talking about before that are a bit too smooth. And what you find with these full waveform inversion results, if I flip back and forth between these two slides, these are the same data sets. There's just a lot more structure that comes from using the entirety of the physics, so everything that's within Maxwell's equations, versus what you would just get from those first breaks. So um, here's an example of a data set that, um, that Jan and his, his group had been looking at. Um, so here's sort of a typical uh, source receiver setup. Um, so the electric field is measured over a, a range of receivers de uh, re receiver depths, and, uh, and that's what's shown here. And the rays indicate the, the travel paths of the source receiver uh, combinations and the, and the ray coverage that's been assumed. So inverting many of these source receiver combinations with the full waveform inversion enables a really high resolution characterization, in this case of a saturated aquifer, um, as, as shown here on the, on the right. The inversion results show a really distinct low velocity layer um, in between the two dashed black lines. That's what's showing up there, which is caused by a higher porosity um, that resulted in a, a higher electrical permittivity and thus a lower GPR velocity. And they know that from some, some well data that's been correlated. Um, this low velocity layer here acts as a waveguide or a preferential flow path that they've confirmed by some high resolution pumping tests. And uh, they use these inversion results as an input to a forward modeling program. Um, and here's the velocity model that they came up with um, to calculate synthetic data, shown here, uh, that shows that the inversion result is very well able to explain the measured data. So it indicates at least that there's some reliability within the system. So people are really pushing the envelope in terms of new inversion, I guess, is the short answer of this. And the last thing I'll talk about here it's just, I've got some circles that are showing up, um, <laughs> is some work of uh, Nicholas Linda, who's at the University of Lausanne. And uh, what he's been doing is I've uh, been pushing the idea of, of integrating multiple data sets by looking at cross gradients. So the idea here is that um, rather than just using our standard uh, um, uh, objective function, which I talked about yesterday, or uh, yesterday, a few slides ago, that have data and model piece, you also have a, gr a cross gradient piece here too. And the idea of these cross gradients is that they're looking at relationships between hydrological and geophysical properties that can be enforced by assuming that the hydrofacies have a certain geometry that can be grouped in objects with the same geometry in which the geophysical properties are approximately constant with respect to surrounding units. So um, this is a, an approach that had its origin in a pretty uh, big research effort to achieve joint inversion of multiple geophysical data sets, starting with the work of Luis Gallardo some 10 years ago. Um, and the idea here is they're looking at change, uh, similarities and patterns of hydrologic facies and geophysical facies and, and trying to capitalize on that. So they're looking at, so that first, that first set of equations there, that first line is that classical least squares data misfit with the cross gradients term. And uh, where they define that cross gradients term in the, the second equation that's shown here. And then that, the, the big sort of important equation at the bottom one, which it just shows that there's a penalization here for structural dissimilarity. So as long as you have reason to believe that the data sets that you're using are uh, correlated in terms of their structure, cross gradients work uh, brilliantly well. And, uh, and they look at this in an iterative approach. And here's a really nice example of that. So this is a simple synthetic test model where they've got two blocks of uh, material within a uniform background. And they look at different types of data here. They look at cross-hole ground penetrating radar. They look at hydraulic tomography. And, um, and then um, they look at a tracer test as well. And so um, what they find is that the hydraulic tomography inversion together with the cross-hole GPR data better identifies those different units, um, while the tracer da data and the GPR allows locating those zones much better. So there's, in this case, there's no underlying rock physics that's been assumed. So it gets us away from some of those problems. The only thing they assume is that the geometries are shared between the geophysical and hydrologic properties. Now keep in mind this assumption is not always valid, um, but it's more realistic and less restrictive perhaps in many systems than assuming some known rock physics relationship. So that's it. Um, I've, I've basically, I've used up my time here and I've been talking too fast anyway, as people from New England do. But um, I just wanted to, to sort of highlight for you guys that there's a lot of tools that are out there that can be used to solve hydrologic problems. And there's some issues that exist, 
with respect to what we're actually measuring and variations in resolution and dealing with the rock physics. And we're working on things like how to scale up to watershed work that people are interested in. And I've shown you a couple of examples here that might help with that. And how do we capitalize on time-lapse changes? How do we capitalize on the properties that we're measuring to get back to what it is that hydrogeologists and hydrologists might be interested in? So with that, I will stop talking. And I would be very happy to um, take any questions if there's time. Thank you very much, Colleen. This is, uh, this is Adam on the line. So I, I know we're at 3 o'clock here. So if, if you're going to sign off, I'd ask that you do that in just a moment so that all of your um, sign-out pings happen at the same time. And uh, Kamini, although um, you didn't get the satisfaction of seeing us nodding along with your presentation, you also don't get to hear the applause that's uh, you know, striking out in one or two offices at most universities across the country right now. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so for those who are going to sign off, I'd ask that you do that now. And for those with questions for Kamini, um, I'd ask that you stay on the line. And please um, feel free to type those questions into the chat box. And we'll use that uh, to try to address questions in order. So with that, go. <laughs> it's, it's over. The talk is over, but I, it looks like I'm taking questions via the chat box. Is that right? If, if you're able to stick around, I'd, I'd like to yeah, Absolutely. Just I have, type in I have, I have questions. No constraints. So uh, commonly, it looks like uh, I'm guessing Selker is probably John Selker um, asking about um, non-expert interpretation. Um, and I think you can probably see that in the, in the chat box. So I won't yeah, read, I'll, I'll read this out loud here to the group. Um, can you speak to the community activity on non-expert interpretation? So far, geophysics is dependent ent entirely upon an expert coming up with a storyline. Is there a movement to try to develop robust methods, or do you think the complexity of these methods will require inclusion of an expert in, in any such study? That's a great question. And um, you know, I, I feel like um, the geophysical community asks the same thing about hydrologists, which is very funny. You know, do they really need hydrologists when they can, you know, sort of make assessments based on their geophysical data? Um, I, I do think that it helps to have someone that communicates across those lines on these projects. Um, for the same reason that I think that I, I know some brilliant geophysicists who are still mapping out porosity at the 10, 10 meter scale because they don't realize that hydrogeologists don't really care that much. Um, similarly, I think there's some of these geophysical tools, especially the reconstruction process, the, um, the inversion process is, is, is messy and is open to some interpretation. I do think that there's a bit of a learning curve to get into that too. I don't think there's any reason why geophysicists can't learn hydrology and hydrologists can't learn geophys geophysics. I think it's just a matter of, of time. I would be wary um, of picking up a, a GPR and dragging it around and, and trying to make interpretations of that the first time without maybe talking to someone who's, who's worked with GPR before, just because there's a lot of subtle stuff that happens within these systems. But I, I don't think there's any reason we can't start um, as a community learning about these new methods. Um, I think the same reason, um, in many ways, that John, for many of you on the, on the line, runs these great DTS workshops. The idea is to get people familiar enough with the method that they can go off and do these things on their own. Similarly, I think the geophysical community needs something of the same sort, where we can train people how to, to think about these tools and the, the data that they have and reconstructing those images and making interpretations, the same way that a lot of geophysicists could probably use a, a class in ModFlow, even. Um, so I, I think that there doesn't. Um, we don't need to continue to segregate these communities from one another, and you need one hydrologist and one geophysicist for all of these projects moving forward, especially as we start to use more of these tools ourselves as hydro, hydro folks. But I do think at the beginning that that relationship is really important in terms of just avoiding a lot of the pitfalls. Um, I have another question here from Todd. Um, have you seen methods that use natural, yeah, oh, that's a great question, natural geophysical inputs, earth tides, earthquakes to estimate material properties? It's funny, we were just talking about this yesterday. Um, I've been participating a bit with the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory now that I've moved institutions. And uh, they see some really great, um, uh, what looks like earth tides within some um, hydraulic head data that they have from within the watershed. And that was the first thing I thought of is like, oh, maybe that could be used to invert for hydraulic properties. There have been some people doing this, and Jim Ye at, at Arizona would be one of the first people that I could think of. One of the hard things, he's been looking at using um, lightning as a source for electrical models. I, and I guess it's no different than people using changes in stream um, stage to estimate hydraulic properties. I guess the problem is always um, trying to get the source function right, at least that's my understanding of it, especially with things like lightning. 
you know, knowing what the source looks like now becomes an unknown also. And so that makes it, I think, a really interesting area of research right now in which there aren't a ton of people working. Um, but man, what a, what a great idea to start. I mean, when we want to think about things at the bigger scale, these natural inputs are a really natural way to, to go about that. Um, and I think it's just a matter of trying to figure out what we're doing with that, with that, initial, um, that initial source. How, how do we quantify the impulse of that lightning so that we can say something about how the voltages have changed throughout the watershed or something? I think that would be really cool. Oh, yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, John Salker just commented about John Lane, who's doing some really neat passive work with uh, seismic, um, passive seismic work. And there has been some passive seismic um, that's existed within the exploration community for some time. The idea here is that you just build up a seismic record based on noise in the background. So suddenly cars driving by is not a bad thing for your seismic survey. You're actually using that as your source. So um, there have been some really nice studies with that too. Thanks, John. I forgot about that. Um, Adam has a question for me. Is the future of geophysics to quantify the physical distribution of parameters um, for example, the distribution of some property, inferring the distribution of hydraulic conductivity, for example, or in developing statistical distributions to describe them, i.e., we can't know the exact property of a specific location, but we can get the statistical distribution. Wow. Hmm. The statistical distribution part is, uh, is actually a little bit tricky, I think. I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm hoping I'm thinking of your question the right way. Um, we have spent a lot of time as a community trying to estimate distributions of properties. And within a Monte Carlo type um, framework, people have looked at you know, how, um, how well we can believe those particular um, parameters based on those, those analyses. In terms of statistical distributions to describe them, um, and maybe actually, maybe Adam is also thinking about moments, for instance, which is what I just talked about here. Um, I think that idea has, has a huge play in terms of moving forward, and, and maybe that relates back to some of the work of Adam Pidlusecki's I was just showing. Um, the idea that, you know, I think that we've been greedy about some of our image reconstruction for those methods where we need to do image reconstruction, um, in that we're trying to solve for boatloads of parameters when ultimately we might only be interested in those distributions. And so I, I think that's still an open research area um, to come up with better. This is where the geophysicists are really needed. Um, those of us that are sort of on the line, like myself, or those of us that are really hydrologists, um, we need these geophysicists in terms of looking at novel ways of thinking about the inverse problem in particular for some of these systems. But if they knew, for instance, if I, if I walked up to someone who thought about inversion methods, and this is how Adam Pizlosecki and I um, had started working on that one project, as I said, all I want to know is, where this plume moves, like how hard can that be? Can you tell me where the plume moves? And, and you know, he wrote, he wrote that code in an afternoon. And so I do think that um, our collaboration with people that think about um, reconstruction would be really important in terms of statistical properties. And, and maybe that's all we need. Maybe we don't need 10 million estimate, you know, point estimates of hydraulic conduct or electrical conductivity to, to say something about um, our system. So yeah, I think that that idea is a really good one. Um, I have another question here from Steve Holbrook. Um, a lot of hydrogeophysics happens with standard off-the-shelf equipment. <laughs> Can you say some crystal ball gazing and say something about uh, nascent developments and non-standard equipment or methods, such as NMR, that might um, change the landscape for hydrogeophysics in the near future? Yeah, so I think that in terms of the hydrology community, and this comes back to maybe John's first question, the idea that you know, do we need experts in-house? I think for some of these tools, they're becoming standard enough that we don't necessarily need to pair up the way we used to. A lot of these electrical tools, um, and even GPR are becoming you know, fairly standardly used. Hydrogeologists aren't uncomfortable with those data anymore. And um, while I do think there's always a problem of garbage in, garbage out on the models, um, I think that those, those types of methods are things where at least the physics are well understood. NMR is a really interesting one, and I, I've, um, I'm still trying to get my hands around it myself. Um, the idea of this nuclear magnetic resonance um, uh, data sets where people are looking at mostly moisture content in this particular case. They might be looking at other things too, but it's really sensitive to that, um, to, to water is basically what they're, they're measuring. And I know they've had some really great success within lab systems, and there's been a big push within the last few years to make more robust field systems. Part of the problem with NMR in the past is that it has been um, really sensitive to noise, and so that's been a particular problem for NMR tools. Um, you know, what I actually think would be incredibly cool in terms of navel gazing, and, or actually you said crystal ball gazing, not navel gazing, that's something else altogether, I guess. Um, it would be um, thinking about some more of these wireless sensors. 
one of the problems that we have within the community, the geophysical community, is that we're cable limited. A lot of the tools that we use are um, constrained by how long we can set up arrays in the field, which is constrained by how much wire we have. But I, I think there's got to be ways, and I'm sure a smart electrical engineer could do this, and I've, I've mentioned this to a, a number of people in the hopes that, that someone knows an electrical engineer that could make this happen, but why we couldn't be driving current in a couple of wired electrodes, but then maybe measuring potential all over a watershed wirelessly. And I know there's timing problems, and I know we're measuring delta V, not V, and so there's some issues there. But I think there's got to be ways for us to set up really large wireless deployments for some of these tools, especially the electrical methods that are so good in a time-lapse way. So I think there's some some new ideas that could be moving forward within the community that would, would really change the way that we as hydrogeologists are able to collect data on sort of watershed scale systems. Um, the off-the-shelf equipment is really great just in that it, um, you know, it gives us a way as, as hydrogeologists who want to use something that's actually got a, a help manual, a manual that's worth something, you know, that, those tools are invaluable. But I do think there's some new tools that we could be thinking about and talking with geophysicists about developing. Um, and, oh, very cool. And so next week, John just made a note that um, he'll be talking about wireless and cell phone-based methods at the DTS, um, well, not at the DTS workshop, at his talk, um, his cyber uh, seminar here next week. And that also he is, is running these DTS workshops, and he has a note here, which I think most of you can see, but he's running one at Stanford at the beginning of December. And I've heard nothing but good things about these DTS workshops. For, so for those of you interested in distributed temperature sensing, it would be a hands-on way to, um, to get into that. So um, a couple things. Are there any other questions? Right, we'll give just a second here for, for any final questions to, uh, to trickle in. No problem. Well, and commonly, please do pass along the thanks of, uh, of Quasi and the audience to, um, wow, a number of colleagues whose examples uh, and whose slides you were able to share with us today that really help give a great overview of hydrogeophysics as, as not just an emerging tool, but really an emerging field um, that we want folks out in the audience to be aware of. Well, thanks so much. It's a really great group of folks. I'm really glad that um, the people gave me some, that they were the ones that made this presentation look good, and so the errors within it are all mine. But uh, it's really an, and some, a community that's really doing some neat things, so I'm, I'm happy to do it. Well. Well, great. I think uh, I, I don't see any other questions um, trickling in, so I think we'll we'll uh, let you off the hook here. <laughs> Thanks. And um, for those of you that um, have questions that you think about offline, I'm, I'm easy to find. I just moved from Penn State to Mines, but um, I'm just casing at Mines, and so if you want to shoot me an email at any time, I'm more than happy to talk geophysics at any time with anyone. Thanks a lot for your time, everyone. Thanks, Kamini. Great presentation today. Bye, guys. <laughs>